I, mean, I want us to um, I want us to go further into this thing. I can feel the real joy of the presence of God actually wanting to come on the meeting because it is a joy to enter into the presence of God. And I want us to engage in a deeper way. I want you to do whatever you need to do to ensure that you can get your spirit man engaging at a deeper level with the presence of God. I don't care what you need. If you want to jump around, if you need to move, dance, lie on the floor, whatever you need to do, just let yourself go so you can be before the presence of God. Try and pretend there's nobody else in here because actually your relationship with God has nothing to do with anybody else. And so I don't really mind what you do, but get yourself into a place where you can engage Him deeper. I want us to go deeper because there's an atmosphere that God is trying to build here for the rest of the day. And I want this to be our platform. And so what I, do, what I encourage you to do, I talked yesterday about opening your heart. Whatever you need to do. The Bible says, you know, as, as you breathe in, it says that the Word of God would flow into us. It says that Jesus breathed on His disciples the Holy Spirit. Well, you've got to breathe in the impartation. So what do you need to do? Engage the impartation God wants to give us this morning. Let's go again. Good job. Okay. Just, just carry on singing. In the Spirit. Yep. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Tristan. It's been really um, awesome to be here. I, um, for those folks who don't know, I was actually, um, this was my home church when I first got saved. And um, to actually come back into it and um, be preaching is quite an interesting experience, to say the least. And so, um, but anyway, um, we got a, a, another set of tapes here that um, my wife gave me just to talk about. One of the keys to living in victory in here, there's just a whole lot of stuff like recognizing demonic activity, dealing with familiar spirits, dealing with generational curses, soul ties, bitter judgments, and how to deal with images inside your brain. And if we get a chance today, we'll deal with some of these things here. And I kind of, there's this gentleman over here, the Chinese, and the, yeah, does it like give the terms just behind you there, please? That'd be great. I think that'll do you good. Um, I, I really, you know, a, a lot of my beginning life in my God life was all involved in spiritual warfare. I mean, I used, to, I used to go out after anything I could get my little hands on to actually wreck it. And it was my greatest pleasure to have the victory in the kingdom and actually see God's kingdom start to grow. And um, my first experience of deliverance was in this church. And um, sitting next to somebody who said to me, oh, you know, Ian, I know you kind of see things differently than what we kind of think about, and, but I've got this problem. And I said, well, it's easy. Let's just pray. All I knew was to pray. So I said, let's pray. And she said, and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus. She goes, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess, I confess. This. <laughs> and this was a Christian lady. And so um, it was my first experience of casting out a demon at a very early age in my Christian walk. And it was a lot of fun. And so from, from that point onwards, it became even more fun because I know I win. You know, when you walk in, they walk out. It's as simple as that. And um, so anyway, yeah, so it's kind of great to be back in this church. It's a great experience. Um, Christians can have demons. I've been around it for 24 years now. And, um, you know, the broken parts of our soul that exhibit the, dis the distinct um, impressions of things that exist inside of us and live in our, in our gateways of our soul. And we will be talking about that today. Um, before I go kind of any further, there's been quite a lot of questions about stuff. And I, I can't answer all your questions, but I can give you some scriptures that might help you. Somebody said to me, um, you said there were some baptisms and I thought it would be really good just to give you the scriptures. You can have a look at them for yourself. The church only teaches two of them. In fact, actually, there's seven very clear, distinct baptisms that we need to go through. So I'm just going to give you those scriptures, and you can go walk through them yourself. Um, for me, I've walked my way through all of these baptisms. Each of them is a specific encounter that leads to a change of your life that is very, very important. Um, the baptisms, the, 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 basically, the doctrines of baptisms is found out of Hebrews 6, 1, 2, and 3, which talks about the foundation. Like, don't lay in the foundations of baptisms. And the church has gone baptism in the Holy Spirit, baptism in water, because they've actually lost the importance of the other ones, and the enemy has eroded those out of the church life because he does not want us to walk in the revelation of those. Because when you do, then everything around you changes because you come into a greater arena of intimacy. Um, and there's one actually on here that I've left the scripture off, and I, um, anyway, whatever. Um, but the first one is found in 1 Corinthians 10.2. 
Um, and, it's, and they'll all be baptized into the cloud with Moses. Now, there's a baptism into the cloud of glory that we need to go through, which brings us into a deeper level of engagement with the realm of the kingdom and the personhood of God. I do talk about my experience of going into the, into the dark cloud. This is what God is looking for, is intimacy and friendship and relationship. And all of us have to go through this baptism. You want to come into a deep intimacy with the Father. I'm not talking about the Son. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism in water is. Anyway, so I'll go through these. The next one is um, Luke 3.3, 3, which is a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin, which is what we go through in a regular, which is um, a baptism where there's a deep repentance that actually comes on a person's life. I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but in, in meetings sometimes you have people will come running to the front and they're just crying, weeping, because suddenly they've got a revelation of their sin and their condition, and it's a deep place of repentance that actually begins to remove the darkness out of the soul of a person. And it is a baptism that comes on a person. And they, they, it, when it hits them, there's nothing they can do. They will bawl their eyeballs out. They will cry. They'll weep and become so aware of their unholy. Um, Luke 3, verse 3. And, and so it's, it's just it's some of these things that the church has missed out on. And there is an experience that we need to go through called the baptism of rem- or the re- repentance or remission of sin. And we need to actually understand these things because they're very important for our lives. This one is found in Acts 1.5 and Acts 10.47. It's, Can any man forbid, to be water, um, forbid water that they should not be baptized? This is the normal thing of water baptism that we go through. Water baptism immerses us into the relational connection with Christ, with Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's your spousal to him. That's your, your, your wedding preparation saying, I'm going down with the expectation to be raised in you again. On that day, you'll come and you'll pick me up. and You'll gather me into your hands or I'll be resurrected into the glory and I'll never have to die. Either way. And, and so it's, it's the issue of our engagement with him. And, and the next one is found in Acts 11:16 16 and Luke 3, 16. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. This is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, where you get immersed in the power and the relational connection with the source of the Holy Spirit. He comes upon your life, and you get blasted by His glory, and then suddenly you can flow in the things that you weren't able to flow, like governmental authority, power, signs and wonders, miracles, all the things that we want, all come out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what for me, and so I'll, I'll kind of cap it off in a minute. The next one is found in, in John 3.16. It says this, um, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost and fire. There is a specific baptism called the baptism of fire, which we need to go through in our Christian life so we can walk into the glory fire of the presence of God. Without that baptism and fire, there will be no understanding of the necessity for holiness in your life, which means you'll continue to do the things you've always done. And, the, and it, what it does is it brings that heightened awareness of the necessity for holiness. And, and so when the Holy Ghost gets on people through the baptism of fire, it, it, it brings everything in your life into sharp focus that's not holy. And, and out of that comes then the baptism of repentance from sin. So you have these, all of these things work together, and you, they kind of work in groups, or they work in, in, as individual experiences. But then they all end up engaging you with the kingdom realm. Um, the next one is found in Romans 6, verse 3. Know you not that as many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Now, I'm not talking about baptizing the dead. I'm talking about the death of Jesus, which is a full acknowledgement of the power of the cross in your life. Unless you get baptized into an understanding of the cross in your life, your life as a believer will always fail. You will always end up in sin. And you need to, the cross has to become a part of your life. It has to be very active in your life. You have to know it. You have to know what is available at the cross for you so that when you struggle with things in your life, you have somewhere to hang it. I went through about a year of dealing with something that that happened to me in my personal life. Um, A circumstance occurred where, whatever, it was just not a very pleasant circumstance where people spoke behind my back and stopped something happening that should have gone ahead. But now I'm really glad it hasn't because I'd never be where I am because I went through an experience that changed my life. And so for a year, I wrestled with the familiars that come around and say, oh, but they don't really like you, Ian. They don't really care about you. See, they're sp-. Now, being prophetic, you can go into the times past and see what people said. So I went in and did this meeting where they were having this meeting and discussing this stuff, and I knew exactly what they'd said. And so I, I, kind of, I, w- I went back to the people and said, listen, I'd like to have an appointment with you, please, because now there's some things you said that I need to get clarification on because your heart is actually not right. 
and you don't understand who I am. And so what you're saying is a lie, and I need to talk to you about that lie. Well, I never, ever had the appointment because they would always avoid me. And so, um, so it, it came to the point where um, I was praying one day, and the Lord said to me, are you prepared to die? I said, well, Lord, you know, I, I am. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. He says, no, no, you're prepared to die. I said, well, if you're asking me, I'll have to say yes because I don't know what the next answer is going to be. And then he said to me, my son stood before Pilate and said not a thing. Are you prepared to say nothing and die? And I said, yes, Lord. Now, don't ever say yes, Lord, flippantly. I didn't know it would take 755 times a day nailing my desire to smash somebody's head in um, and nail it to the cross. And, and you know, I'm just being facetious there, but if you can understand, the motive for revenge, the motive to justify yourself before another so that, that you can feel yourself be clean. You have to die to that motive. And so I spent a year wrestling with this demon every day, like a year of my life, 700 odd times a day. It would go, you really need to go and do this. You really need to say something. No, I take you and I nail you to the cross. You will die. I will not submit to you. Go home 10 minutes later. No, are you? I... Day after day after day after day for 364 days of the year. Every day getting baptized into an understanding of what it means to face the cross. And it came a day when I, like, I would wake up in the morning and I'd li be lying in bed waiting for it to happen. Waiting for this thing to come at me, and I actually began to enjoy it because what I'd do is I'd wreck it, stand it, and go into the presence of God and lay hold of it and draw what I needed out of his kingdom. And so it became a stepping stone. So what the enemy purposed for death became a stepping stone into the glory for me. So I'd wait, and it became my springboard. The moment it would start, I'd stand it, I'd take it, slap it, face it on the cross, step right through into the glory. It was a wonderful experience, 365 days. Now, now, instead of just wrestling with it, I'm now spending, going into the Spirit, 300, what, 700 times a day by smashing his face on the cross and stepping into the glory. So every time I'd wait for it to come, because it was a great experience, to smash his head on the cross and walk through it into the glory. So I would wait for it to come. And you know, if you practice a pathway long enough, it, you can do it really quickly. So I'd wait. The moment it would go, whack, and I'm in the presence of the Lord. It was just an amazing experience. And it came on the 365th day, and I was waiting in bed, waiting for it to all start, saying, Lord, this is another day when I'm going to have a war, and it's going to be glorious because I'm going to win. So it goes from the desperation of failure to the desperation of the knowledge you're going to win. And I was, I was lying in the bed there, and nothing happened. I got up out of bed, and I, I was sort of walking around the home, waiting for the voices of the enemy to start around you. Unless you've nailed your life to the cross, you will always have enemy voices around you in the spirit. They'll stop you hearing the presence of the Lord speaking to you. And I nailed this thing. And, and so I woke up and I was I walked down the passage and I was waiting for everything to start. And there was, there was just, it was dead silent. There was room and space. And I was going, this is amazing. This is amazing. And the Lord said to me, yeah, you've now died to yourself. And that's what this baptism is all about. So my baptism took me a year to walk my way through that baptism. And so, you know, when, when people say, have you died to yourself? Well, I, I think a little bit. The next one is found in 1 Corinthians um, 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It's called the baptism of unity. And it's very important that the body of Christ understand this baptism. Now, baptism and unity actually means deep repentance and coming to a place of unity out of repentance. It's not about me having to believe your doctrine or you and I having a fight over something that I believe is different than what you believe. It's actually got nothing to do with that kind of unity. What it's got to do is about the unity of the desire of the heart to engage his realm and his kingdom and to be with him. That's what it's about. It's not about doctrinal belief. It's about desire. Everything is birthed out of desire. And so the seven baptisms have been very, very important in my own personal life and in the engagement of the kingdom realms that I've had to walk into. I've had to experience each of these baptisms, and the church doesn't teach them. And it was about a year and a half ago that um, when I was with Enoch, I, I began to ask him some questions. So, oh, I want to know where he went and what he did and why he did the stuff he did. And um, in that conversation, he, he, and I, he, the, the, the kingdom realm was amazing because... 
They, they know your need. Like the Bible talks about us being encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, and we don't understand actually those witnesses are here and very present, and they're actually around us, and you can see them if you choose to. And you can engage them if you choose to, but most people don't. So, you know, you miss out on a great storehouse of knowledge that they can release to us. There are, there are mentors and tutors out of Galatians 4.1. It's also the seven spirits of God are mentors and tutors. And so, anyway, whatever. And so, um, I, I, I can remember kind of going through this thing with Enoch. And he, and he said to me, you know, Ian, you, you've yearned after the Father. You've desired to know him and to come into a relationship with him. And he's walked, you've walked with him and you've been into Eden. You've done all these things in the kingdom. But there's something you're missing. Actually, you've never identified with them. And I said, I beg your pardon? And he said to me, you've never identified with them. He said, you've been into the river of the glory of the Holy Spirit. You've been filled and baptized in his glory. And you've experienced a relational connection with the, with the Holy Spirit. Then you've been into the waters of baptism, and you've experienced a relational connection with Jesus. But tell me, where have you done that with the Father? And I went, oh my goodness, what am I missing here? Because they're a triune God. And I, I, I said to him, I said, what do I need to do? I mean, it's a normal question. What do I need to do, Lord? And, um, and he said to me, Ian, you need to go and baptize yourself in the glory of the river that runs out from under the throne. You need to go and stand by where it pours out and jump into that river. And so I went and stood by that river and I jumped into the river expecting to sink into it. Well, it, when I hit it, it was like going into honey just sort of slowly sunk into it because it was oil and diamonds all mixed together, running out with his presence and the voice of God and the sound of his thunder and the glory and who he is. And, the identification. and I went into that water and I came out covered with these little stones all over my body. And from that point, my relationship with the Father has changed. I've got a connection with him now. And so, you know, you, you can go, whatever. I don't, I'm just saying, this is, this is my experience. And so if you, don't, you know, if you don't believe it, that's great. That's your problem. I've been there, so whatever. And so anyway, so I found that we've had to, a bit of walk through some of these things, and each of those baptisms does different things. Um, man, um, hallelujah. We'll get to, well, I've, got, I've got so much stuff I want to talk about. Last night, I was in, when I was in the Spirit, I was going through all these, all these things, talking with some of the chancellors, just saying, what do I need to do? And they went, well, you need to do this, 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 and this, and this. And I was going, but I don't have enough time to do all that stuff. They said, well, do a little bit here and do a little bit here and just throw this in here and do this. And I was going, okay, well, I'll try and do that. But, you know, uh, we're confined to time and space. And so you live outside of it, so it's really good for you and easy for you to say that, but not for me. And so, but anyway, um, hallelujah. Um, each of these baptisms are very important for us in our individual lives. The first baptism prepares us for marriage. The second baptism prepares us for restoration. The third baptism prepares us for renewal. The fourth baptism prepares us for revival. The fifth baptism prepares us for refreshing. The sixth baptism prepares us for resurrection. The seventh baptism prepares us for release of blessing. And so each of these baptisms are very, very important. Um, if you want all those again, get the CD. And so it's very, very important for us to actually understand that God wants to do something really unique in our day. And these truths are coming back into the church of God because they're being released from the scrolls that have been locked up since Daniel's time that we would again walk in the knowledge of some of these things and that the, the secrets that have been written there would be revealed to us in this day. God wants them to be part of our life. He wants us to be actively engaged in his kingdom, walking in the revelation of the knowledge of him and his glory in the realm that we are called to be facilitators of on the face of the earth. And so you know, I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. It's a whole teaching I do on it and then... It's actually based around the baptism of fire, this teaching, and so I just laid some foundation there for you on some of the other stuff. But the baptism of fire is a whole teaching on its own, whatever. It's under the blood. Glory to Jesus. By the way, when I say under the blood, it's not some religious refrain, as somebody has said to me one day. That's a religious refrain for you to avoid having personal contact with somebody and actually speaking to them. Well, actually, for me, when I say it's under the blood, what I'm talking about is the divine vibration of the manifestation of the glory of the power of God in his DNA that brings divine order into chaos. So when I say it's under the blood, that's what I'm saying. It just saves me having to have that big, long sentence. So it's under the blood, divine order and chaos. Hallelujah. So what I want to do today is, um, if I can just get um, some people just to pass these around. You all want to just grab one of these. Um, there's a whole lot of you folks who weren't here yesterday. And a whole lot of you were here yesterday that have run away. It's all good. Praise God. Hallelujah, Father. 
I'm just giving you these so that um, when I'm talking about them, you can um, kind of just, just pass them. Let them go along the road, mate. Just, just pass them around and pass five or six down the road. Just give a bundle and you just pass them further back as they go down. You know, the, the, the scroll room of records is an amazing place when you want to understand some things. You can go and get knowledge about stuff from the, from the chancellors and from the king's court and things that are in the mountain of God. The mountain of God is God's house. And you, go, you have to go into the mountain to understand the dimension of the kingdom and understand how he operates out of his mountain and the throne that is on that mountain and how to function as a son from the mountain. And on the mountain is a throne. And God rules from the throne. And as sons, we need to understand we have a mountain and we need to rule from that throne as well. Anyway, so is anyone that doesn't have one? Just hold your hands up. There's a few more at the back there. Hallelujah. We're getting, getting to you folks. Praise God. You have in your hand about five years of my life. Um, this is my impression of what I saw on a scroll when I asked how we were made. And it took me quite a lot of time to decipher it, to understand the dimension of what God was wanting to do in my own personal life. And so... I went through a process of trying to engage to get some understanding about this stuff, and I would talk to everybody I could about the body, soul, spirit. I even got into talking with psychiatric counselors and psychologists, and I love talking to psychologists, by the way, because I really confuse them, because um, I can show them the spirit world is real, because I can feel it when you start talking. And um, Anyway, it's all good. Thank you. And so what, what began in my life began, became a journey, and what I've done is, is I've kind of put some of their journey down in this little booklet thing that I have here. It's called The Gateways of the Threefold Nature of Man. Um, and so often God holds something out to us like this and says, who wants us, you know? And, and, and no one ever comes and takes it. And so it just continues to sit there because no one ever wants to come and take it. And so whoever wants to come and take it, you can take it. That's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, but you, you can see what happens in the Spirit is God does exactly the same thing. And he says, says to his church, Here's something, and we all come and looking because we're trying to figure out from a single plane dimensional being how it all operates. God says, here, let's take it. And often we end up in a mess because we actually don't realize all God's looking for you is to take one step towards him, and then he'll, take, he'll give you the rest. And so um, I went through this journey of, of trying to figure out how to, how to put all this together and how to function as a spirit being because I'm called to be a spirit being, not a... Not a, not a, not a um, a human being that has a body and a soul that sort of has a spirit somewhere along the line. I am a spirit being that has a soul that lives in a physical body in the confines of time and space in a physical body subject to the time and space I currently live in. And so I went through this pro process and, and the, the little manual is just a part of my journey and the things that I had to walk in with all the gateways and how I walked my way through them. And I want to cover a bit of that today with you so that um, to, to, and so you can take this paper home and begin to work with it yourself. It's very, very important that you understand some of the foundation of gateways and, and, so, and, and what they are for. And it's, it's, it's interesting, when I first started doing some of the study on this stuff, I came up with this massive revelation that whatever controls the gate controls what goes in and out. And it was like, it was a major revelation to me when I was... Um, in this place of, of trying to understand this thing because you know, I would find in the historical documents that everything about the gate was the key. Wherever the drawbridge was down, the city was lost, all this kind of stuff. And um, even, in, even in history, in the Jewish history, it's like everything was about the gate. The tax collector sat at the gate. The, you know, the, the whatever, all, everything happened in the gate. And so I'll, I'll just give you some of these scriptures just to, so that if any of you folks are Greek and you want a few scriptures, then that's fantastic. You can have them. Um, business transactions occurred in the gates, 1 Kings 22.10. Legal transactions occurred in the gates, Ruth 4, 1 to 11. Criminal cases and disputes and judgments happened in the gates, Deuteronomy 25, 7 to 9. Proclamations were made in the gates, Jeremiah 17, 19 to 20. Festivities were declared in the gates, Psalm 24, verse 7. Protection was declared in the gates, 2 Samuel 18, 24. And it just goes on. 
it just goes on. And it's amazing when you begin to realize, actually, the activity that goes on around a gate. Now, I know, as a human being, that I struggle with my flesh. So that means there's things that sit on my flesh gate. Anybody ever gone past Kentucky Fried Chicken and not had your mouth water? Well, if you have, you've been delivered. Praise God. <laughs> but it, it, it's like, you know, it, when you see something that's really amazing, your, your eyes are kind of drawn to it, or you hear sounds that are amazing. You're, you're, everything kind of picks up towards it. And so, so there, there is a massive influence that goes on from the outside penetrating inwards, but that is not the way we were designed and not the way we should flow as a believer. And because of the deliverance stuff I'd been involved in, I recognize that things lodge inside the soul of people and they live in the doorways of the soul of a person and control what goes in and out. And so here was I trying to pray and engage God and actually there was no flow coming from my spirit because it could not penetrate through a gateway of my soul because part of that gate was controlled by a demon spirit that would stop the flow. You know, it's like you're having your conscience here. The Bible is very clear. It's, all these gates, by the way, are in the Bible. You can go and get all the scriptures, about 450 of them, or whatever. You just go and do them yourself. Go and do your own study. This is to actually motivate you to go and do some study. I spent, this is, as I say, this is five years of my life trying to interpret, get an understanding of how I was supposed to flow as a supernatural being in a natural world. And you'll find there that the arrows go from the inside out. Everything must come from the inside out. The river, and you'll find this is set up just like the temple. And that's one of the things that really amazed me. There's an outer court, the body. There's an inner court, the soul. There's a holy place, the spirit. And there's a holy of holies in the middle of the spirit where the presence of God lives. It's set up just like the temple. It kind of freaked me out when I first discovered that. It was only about two years after I'd written this thing and trying to work with it all. I, I, I made four different wheels. Because each of those gates need to, needs to flow through each of the other gates until it reaches the flow on the outside of your body. The Bible says, out of your belly, or your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. If I want the water to flow, you've got to remove obstacles that hinder the water from flowing. And so the biggest problem is to get my gates free so the water can flow properly. So there's no hindrance, there's no demonic, demonic, de, demonic attachments inside them. There's no hindrance. <clears throat> also, what I found too is that in some of my journey is that I would, I would engage stuff in my spirit and, 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 with my, and then I begin to release the flow of the river of glory into my soul, but I'd find that I couldn't find the gate. I'd be praying, you know, particularly my, my gateway of my conscience. My conscience had been seared by the things that I'd done in the world. And I'd be praying in my conscience gateway, and it would just be like coming up against a blank wall. And so I, I do describe in the book some of the ways that I tackled some of those things to deal and open up the gateway so that it would function properly particularly with us as a spirit being, as believers, you find many of your spiritual gateways are not functioning. And many of them are very small, and they're weak and atrophied muscles of your spirit. And so they're actually worn down, so it makes it hard for your spirit man to actually begin to be exercised and stand up in the government that it's been designed to stand up in. And so for, for me, if you know, you, you know somebody in the natural arena, if... They don't do exercise for years and years and years. You begin to look like me, and then you, know, you kind of end up in a problem where you want to do exercise, but when you do it, it hurts. You know, you, you, if you go to the gym and you haven't been to the gym for you know, months and months and months, and you do some exercises, the next three days you're going to know about it. Because you'll be going, oh, wow, I didn't know I had that muscle sticking around the back of my neck there. I just, that's just what happens in the natural arena. So how much more in the spirit? When our spiritual muscles are not exercised, and we start to exercise them, and everything inside you goes, ow, ow, ow. That's why people give up, because they're so busy going, ow, ow, that they don't realize that actually what God is trying to do is to actually grow muscles around your spirit man. And so I, I kind of went through this journey of, um, of, of walking my way through these gates, and I was saying I made these four wheels, and I would, I would have them so I can turn the dials around and, and engage. Every day I would engage a gateway all the way through to the outside and I'd pray through these gateways and, and, and try and work my way through them. And it was amazing because I, I, the natural tendency is to try and work from the outside in because you, know, you have people say that you've got to discipline your flesh and you've got to bridle your flesh and you've got to stop sinning. And so you try and stop sinning from the outside, not realizing actually you set yourself up for failure anyway because you're living by the law of sin and death then instead of the law of the spirit of life in Christ, which actually frees you from the power of sin. And so I try, and stop, I try to not stop, uh, sorry, I try to stop sinning. Well, instead of actually trying to stop sinning, when you change the inside where you don't want to sin anymore? And so I, I went through this thing of trying to shut the, these things down and, I, and this process, like 
as I say, five years of my life. And so I walked my way through some of this. And so I began to realize that we as believers have been taught so wrong in, in the, the process of the cross, the process of the life that God has given us to flow with, that we are taught from the pulpit, you've got to stop doing things. Actually, the moment you try and stop doing something, you set yourself up for failure because it becomes a source of your focus. And whatever you turn into becomes a source of your supply. So when you try and stop doing something, you turn into it and you focus on it and, and give it the power to become your supply. Instead of actually turning away from it, which is what repentance really is, turning away from it to a different source of supply that will change the power of that thing. And so through the process of engagement and, and, and engaging the arena of the kingdom like this, I realized that um, there was still something lacking in my life. There was like this emptiness and this void. I'd come into church and I'd worship. And you got to understand, I had been in the spirit. I had been in the kingdom realms. I had experienced, not to the measure I have today, but some of the things that, that I experienced then were just like, wow, and so kind of new. And, and no, you couldn't talk about them because everybody would just look at you and go, oh, you're a space kid, you're no earthly good. And that's good because I'm glad I'm no earthly good because I don't want to be earthly good. I want to be heavenly good. And so I, I kind of went through this, this process of trying to figure out stuff by myself. And a lot of my life was spent um, in church, I'd be worshiping, or not worshiping, but actually engaged, walking my way through the stuff while everybody was busy singing. I was trying to figure out how to flow, what it felt like, the function of my spirit, how do I feel my spirit, how does my spirit man work, what does it feel like to have my spirit man flowing through my soul, through my body in worship, how does that function, what flow does it look like, what does it look like in the spirit realm? So when everybody's going, la, 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 I'm, I'm working on the stuff, chugging away with this V8 sitting inside me. And so... I began, to, I began to experience some stuff, and I, I realized that I yearned after intimacy with the presence of God that I couldn't find. Like, it seemed to be absent. Like, I, I wanted to actually, I wanted to get around Him to get to know Him. I wanted to feel Him. I wanted to feel the longing and the passion and the, and the, the kind of yearning to actually just feel Him. And I, I and, and I'd be in church, and I, God, I want to, Lord, I just, this isn't enough. This worship sucks. This is just not, in, and you know, and it's just not enough. And some of it was in this church, but anyway, whatever. And so, and so I kind of, I, 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 and this is my early Christian life. And so, um, I, I began to realize that God needed to change me, and I, and I needed to change. And there's some things I, there was, if I can't do something, it means there's a problem. I, so I went on this you know, massive fast. You know, when you, you can't find anything, no one will give you answers. You've got to start doing this for yourself. Two years later. So that, in those two years, I developed the capacity in me where I had a very strict regime of fasting and praying. I would fast fairly regularly every week. I'd do a day, then whatever, and we'd just do these long fasts. And the most frustrating thing for me about fasting is when I do a 40-day fast, I don't lose any weight. I just like, to me, that is really gutting. At least I would have some other natural benefit from it. And you have people who do long fasts, and they lose 60 kilos. And I'm going, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, so, well, actually, so what it means is that God wants the tank big to hold more glory. So, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> Anyway, that was just, I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. But anyway, whatever. Um, and so I, I kind of realized that there was something missing in, in my life, in the realm of intimacy with the presence of God that I needed to, to deal with. And there's a scripture, like I, at that stage, I was starting to memorize a whole book of Revelations, trying to get my God out of the Word, and trying to understand that the Word wasn't God, but the Word was the way to God. And so in my struggle with that, I decided to memorize the whole book of Revelations because I thought it would be a good book to memorize. And so I started with Revelations 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Got to, got to about around there and I was kind of going, man, this is kind of really different because I could sit around at, at work and actually quote scriptures in my head all the time, just trying to go over so I didn't forget everything, you see. And, I, I, and I, you know, when, you, when you're engaging the realm of heaven and God wants to speak to you, particularly in the measure that your desire is, He'll open up something to you. And I was busy reading in my head like I'm walking around swimming pool and, and, and kind of 
You got all the, everybody around you, but I'm encased in this canopy of the man, uh, of the tabernacle intent of God, just quoting scripture to myself. You're looking at people, but actually not really seeing them, just seeing the kingdom, wanting the kingdom. You know, walking around and whatever. And so, I um I was quite, and so I kept on coming across the scripture that says, you know, um, do, uh, let me just read it to you so I get it right here. Um, and actually, I haven't written it down. It's very naughty. Um. So Revelation talks about don't lose your first love whilst I come and I'll remove the candlestick from the midst of you. And, and, I, 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 and the scripture kept on going, don't lose your first love, don't lose your first love, don't lose your first love. And I went home and I wake up with it going to my brain, don't lose your first love. I say, God, what on earth are you talking about? First love, just, well, you know, what's that? And so I began a six-month journey of my life trying to uncover what first love was. Because there's some major issues in my own life through the boundary of the, of the binding associated with first love that was a major hindrance to my engagement with the presence of God. And so in talking with psychologists, I discovered that first love is something they call puppy love. That really nice kind of little thing, you know, that you sort of do this out of this euphoric state of being, you know, where nothing really matters around you. Everything's wonderful because you just have this euphoric sense of this apparition of beauty that kind of walks around, you know, when you're at school. And so I, I, what, I st what started to happen to me was memories started to come back of things that had happened to me in my life. And so very clear memories started to be generated of things that had happened to me. And, and one of the first ones was that I can remember, you know, I don't know, this must have been about seven or, seven or eight or something like that kind of sitting in this classroom, and you know when you're about that age, you have these apparitions of beauty that walk into a classroom. And this girl walked in and was just like smitten. Like totally smitten. And, and, and it was just like, wow. You know, you can't take your eyes off them. It's amazing how similar it is to our desire for God. It's like I couldn't take my eyes off her, and I was, it was like, you know, and then and you do these crazy things when you're in love. You know, you write notes. Do you love me? Yes, no. Um, will you meet me outside? And actually, it's all fantasy because they, they have no idea what, you, what you're living in unless you, you... And so, you know, I used to put myself in her way just so that she would do this and look at me. And oh, when she would look at me, the rest of the day would be one euphoric, lovely experience. <laughs> living out of the encounter. Living out of the encounter. And so I can remember writing a note, thinking that I would slip it in her bag when she walked out and, and I stood up from the desk and it fell out of my book. Fell on the floor. And the teacher picked it up. Unfortunately, she read it to the class. At that point in my life, I can remember making the statement inside of me, no one will ever see me like that again. About a year later, sometime later, I can remember being in another experience, you know, you go back in the classroom and you get over the first deadfall and then you kind of start all over again because this is the pattern in a human. Because we, if we don't walk our way through first love in the truth and in the right manner, then actually our intimacy with God is deeply affected and the enemy knows this, so he tries to shut it down and control it so we can't function at a first love. And so I can, I can I had this, the other memories started coming and so I, I can remember this time of, Again, sometime later, year, whatever it was later, walking into this classroom and there's this, again, apparition of beauty. But an apparition of beauty. Walked in the classroom. And in my, own, in my, my heart and my life, it was like, wow, look at that. And I used to try and stand next to her in class lines. So we, if we, just if we would touch. You know, when you, when you happen to walk around a corner and you touch them, it's just like... And the whole, the rest of the day, you're walking around with lightning, you know, gzz, 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 oh, boy, that was, I touched her, I touched her, oh, we touch, and your whole mind and heart gets caught in that fantasy, and so, and you kind of live in this thing, you see, and so I can remember kind of standing, uh, sorry, coming home, and walking up our stairs to our home, and, and we had these caps we used to wear for school, and taking my cap off, and looking inside the fridge and putting my cap in the fridge and shutting the fridge door, <laughs> walking away. And my father started to laugh. And he laughed, ha, 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 ha. 
Ian's in love. I can remember making an end of hour that day. No one will ever see me like that again. And then about a year later, again, the same kind of thing. You see, these things come. And unless you can journey your way through them in the right manner, the enemy knows he can shut you out of the presence of the Lord in deep intimacy. And so I can remember the last, the, the, the last one when, when the thing shut in my life. I can remember going through this process and kind of, again, you know, you, you kind of get in the stage where you've now been hurt. You don't really want anyone to know. But actually, when you begin to fall in the feeling of being in love, actually, it changes a lot around you and you forget the pain of the past. You forget the consequences of the experiences you've had because of the euphoria of the expectation of what you desire, which is no different with God. And so... Um, I, I can remember going through this process and, and, and you know, again, you're a little bit older and so you have more, and because I was the, kind of the class captain because I was a sports freak, you, uh, you, you would kind of line up in first and she was also another sports freak. And so I would always be standing next to her and it was just like, you know, and I'd set myself up so I could, I could wait for her to come around the corner and, and I would look at her and she would look at me and she would smile and when she smiled, it was like heaven just came down. And, um, and because I was just so handsome, you see, she had a smile, no, whatever. And so I can remember going through this thing and, and then, then one day standing at the edge of this classroom waiting for her to come around just so I'd step out in front of her and have to walk past her. You know how you set things up so that you can get what you want, which is normally the way that we try and work anyway. And so I can remember going past this and waiting at the edge of this classroom and there was three boys who were my friends who were standing behind me and they saw me doing this. And they started to laugh, and you know how kids are with a demonic thing that's inspired to shut you down? <laughs> look, look, it's in love, ha, 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 everybody, it's in love, ha. I can remember making an interview, no one will ever see me like that again. And so now I get born again, I come into church, and I'm now in church, I'm now a 10 to 12 year old Christian, and I will get intimate with the presence of God. You think so? I can remember being absolutely frustrated in church going, God, I want to know you, I want to feel you, I want to see you, but actually I've made some inner vows that no one will ever see me like that again. I've, ma I've conditioned myself to r override every other desire so that for self-protection in my soul. And so I had to go through the journey of breaking down the chains and the shackles that were associated with that. In that diagram, you'll see in the very center of the diagram, I've got the glory of God. The first gateway of entry into the realm of the presence of God is the gateway of first love. That is the deepest measure of intimacy and relationship you can ever have with the presence of God. I had to go into my spirit and strip the bindings that I had put over that door in my life. Now, you know, it's amazing how... The natural environment actually sometimes dictates things in the spirit and has, a, has an imagery that, that kind of says something but doesn't. And it isn't until you look at it closer that, and you experience something that you realize that actually there's a lot of things in the natural arena that, that can show us things in the spirit and how they operate. Um, I can remember when I was younger looking at this um, movie called um, Towering Inferno. Like, you know, you used to see things when you were young, stupid things and whatever. So those who are old enough, like me, if you're 195 years old, then it's really good because you'll remember what I'm talking about. Um, that's my faith. And so um, I can remember this movie, and, and in the movie there's a scene of these two guys that um, stand at the edge of this door, and there's a glass panel on the side of this door, and they, they both look through the door, and when they look through the door, everything's fine. Like there's a seat there, the carpet's there, everything's there, all nice like that. And they look at each other, and then they walk off, but what happens is the cam when, the, when the camera watches them walk off down the passage, it pans back to the mirror, to the, to, the, um, to the window image, and then focuses on it, and then underneath it you can see this hazy thing. The whole room is like it's shimmering. Like this, it's just kind of shimmering. And then it pans down onto the ground. When it pans down the ground, you see this, this kind of stuff come out from under the door, and it kind of goes... And what that is, is the, the inside of the room is actually on fire. But because there is no oxygen to supply the visual color that generates the flame, 
you can't see that the room's on fire. And the holy of holies in the middle of your being is like this. You can't see that it's on fire. And, but as it burns, and it is constantly alight and ignited with His glory. And I, I, you're going to say, I don't know. Well, this, this is, this, I'm now telling you after the fact. So I'm now standing in front of the door, and because it's a door, I stood in front of a door, and I opened and closed the doors, and I did all the door things, you know, so I can get an anchor, so that the spiritual reality, what I'm trying to understand and get to grips with, so that Jesus says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and have deep intimacy and communion with him. Now, that isn't for people who get saved. It's actually for believers who need to get their, their first love back into its right order. So Jesus is standing on the inside of me. He's now saying, knock, 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 knock. If you open the door, I will come into you, and actually I will have deep intimacy and communion with you on the inside. And so I didn't know this at that stage. And so I was kind of looking at this door, no handle on it. I said, Lord, what do I need to do about the door? Da, 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 da. And so eventually what happened is I opened the, <coughs> excuse me, peppermints, <coughs> is I opened the door. About an hour and a half later, I got off the floor. Because what had happened when I opened the door, the fire that was in behind that holy place opened up and touched into my spirit man. And I can remember getting off the floor and everything was different. Like everything was different. I felt different. I would see things differently. I would perceive things differently. I would feel the atmosphere differently because it came from a totally different perspective now. And I can remember for the, that Sunday, when the Sunday, I was so looking forward to getting into church. And this wasn't in this church now, this was down in the church in Hastings where I've been for 23 years. I, 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 could, I could remember going into church thinking, oh my Lord, at long last, I'm going to feel you. I, I'm going to, oh, if I just get a glimpse of your eyes, if I just feel your touch when you walk past into the meeting. And my whole being started to turn for the passion of the presence of God again. And I can remember sitting in church at the back, and everybody was worshiping. And I'm sitting there crying, going, Lord, where are you? Lord, I just want to see you. I want to know you. I want to feel your presence. I yearn. I yearn after you, Father. I yearn to know and be touched by your presence. And I felt him turn up in the meeting and he stood there. It was just like, my life changed. Because for the first time in my life, I'd come back to what it really meant to be passionately in love, being able to be abandoned before others without worrying about the opinion of what I would look like when I'm in love. And so that was just one gate. All of the gateways of my body, soul, spirit, I've had to work through in similar, similar fashion, dealing with stuff, releasing that fire of first love, of the glory, of the mandate where I engage God into my body and out of my body into the world around me. That's how you bring influence. If you want to know, if you're a leader and you have me and you've, eh, <laughs> I'll just, I, I'm going to say something here. Often people get put in positions because of convenience. It's not about position that God's interested in. It's about influence. If you want to know if you're a leader, turn around and see he's following you, then you'll know how good a leader you are. It's got nothing to do with position in a church. You know, anyway, whatever. And so I, I kind of walked my way through, through this process of, of releasing the glory out of my spirit, sorry, out of the gateway of first love into my spirit man, through the gateways of my spirit man, then from each gateway of my spirit man into my soul, from each gateway of my soul into the each gateway of my body. So each gateway was connected and totally entwined and connected with one another. And so it made it easier for me then to be able to function as a spirit being because everything then was flowing from the inside out. And there you have the different soul gateways. Um, I can pick on any one of those and talk about them. One of the ones I really love talking about is the mind. Because the mind is something that I've been working with and trying to get to grips with to free so that the mind which is in Christ could be in me. And the fullness of that mind, the revelation of it. And so um, just before I do that, I want to come back to this first love thing. Um, in recognizing that, I realize that my, each of my children will go through a process of first love in their life. Because I had been broken, 
I covenanted with the Lord to actually nurture my children for that first love so that they would never be broken, so that their heart would continue to have a place of openness to be abandoned in love, not only with God, but actually with others that are around them. So there's no hindrance there. And so my eldest daughter was probably the one that I'd walk the deepest through some of the stuff with. And um, when she was about eight or nine, ten years of age, she kind of came home. Because we're a very open family, by the time my children were nine and ten, they knew everything there was to know about sex. They knew everything there was to know about the spirit realm. They knew everything there was to know about anything I teach them. I'm not afraid of talking about these things because I'm not embarrassed about anything. So if somebody wants to know something, I'll tell them straight and teach them and show them and talk. I won't show them, but I'll talk to them about specific stuff. You know, there are boundaries, very good boundaries that are in place. But because I love my children, I want them to experience the best. And so my daughter came home one day and, and she sat down with me. And I used to have these dad's dates where I would set up with my children because I was so busy that once a week they'd have a dad's date with me where they'd have two hours of me alone by themselves where we can go do anything they wanted to do. And so often all they'd want is time with me. So I'd take them on my push bike and I'd seat them in a seat in front of me and we'd go around and we'd talk about Jesus, we'd talk about the kingdom, we'd talk about the grass and the birds and the bees and, and we'd go and buy ice creams and we'd sit in the park and we'd play fight and whatever. Whatever it took, I was just going to do it. And so I, that was the first thing that I realized that I needed to do was to actually nurture my family because if I can't do it with my family, I can't do it in the body of Christ. And so um, my daughter came home and, and I, I took her on a dad's date because I knew something was going on because I could see it and... And, I, and it's one of the disadvantages of being with somebody who's a spirit freak in the family is that I know everything that's going on with my kids. And like, it's like now, if I wanted to know what's going on with my family, because I hold them in my heart, and the spirit can go and look into my family and tell you exactly what my children are doing and exactly where they are. And it's, and it's, it's, it's really neat because you can engage it and you can facilitate it and see it. And that's how we're supposed to be with the church. That's how you're supposed to be with the blood in the church. That's how Paul could say, although I'm absent, I'm present in the Spirit, and I've already judged, and my judgment is true, because I've been present with you while you've been speaking. It's wonderful stuff. And so I, I walked my daughter, and so anyway, so we had this dad's date, and, and she said, Dad, I've got this guy who's asking me to go out, and I talked to her about the boundaries of relationship and how you can get hurt, and the process of what happens if you get hurt, and, and all of that stuff, and how you, it's great to feel the feeling of being in love, and it's a wonderful feeling, and it's really nice, and I got her to talk to me about what it felt like, and so that she was able to express it, because if you can get somebody the, the words to verbalize something, then they can get to grips with, with what they're feeling, and so I got her to talk about it, and what it felt like, and how she felt, and, and it was amazing to watch her go through the emotions of the experience the same way as I've gone through the emotions with the experience with God, and unlocking the stuff, and it was, it was, it was, so I said to her, honey, in the end, actually, you've got to make a choice. And I said, you either, you know my boundaries, you know my desire for you, that I want the best for you and that I love you. And my desire is that you would walk through this properly, that you wouldn't come out broken because of it. And I said, I want you to pray. I want you to go and ask God because you, he speaks to you. You go into heaven, you experience him, you go and talk with him. I want you to go and ask him. I want you to go and ask him, ask him, Daddy, what do you want me to do? And so she went and asked Daddy what he wanted her to do. And so the next morning she came and she sat on my bed and she said, Dad, I spoke to Dad last night and, 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 he, and he said I wasn't to go, really hurt. I wasn't to go out with him and go to this movie. He said, it really hurt. And I said, well, that's okay, honey. And so I prayed with her. We went into heaven and we talked and did all the stuff that you're supposed to do with your kids. And so um, that day I, I, I said to her, listen, I, wanna, I want you to come with me, honey, because I want to go and buy some flowers. And she didn't know what I was about, but she, you know, I go and buy K roses sometimes. And so she was all excited about buying. So, so I got over in the flower shop and said, hey, I want you to choose the ones that you really like. I want you to pick the flowers you really like, the ones that you think, you think will be the best. And she goes and she picks these roses. And you've got to understand, roses are expensive. And so, but anyway, that's the price I'm willing to pay. I'll do anything to ensure that gate stays open in her life. And so she picked these roses and we paid for them. And, and she thought we were going home, but we drove down to the park. And I, and I, and I, I took, took these roses out of the car. We went for a walk. And she said to me, Dad, why are you bringing those roses? So I sat her on the ground, and I, and I stood in front of her, and I looked her in the eyes. She said, Honey, I'm your dad, and today I want to honor you for the choices you have made in maintaining your door and your relationship with God above everything else. I want to honor you for the choices you have made as a woman to actually not yield to the temptation of your flesh. I want to give you these roses as a gift from me. Now, you've got to understand something. This lays the foundation for a child to have an intimacy and a relationship with the presence of God. This is what we're supposed to do with our children. We're supposed to grow them up 
in the admonition and understanding of the Lord. Teach them how to be in the kingdom. Teach them kingdom principles, and it makes it a lot easier. All my children like that. All my kids, you can talk to my kids, they all go in the spirit. It's nothing, it's normal. It's because you've taught them how to be like that. It's not hard. And so, anyway, um, so that, that's how you, you've got to walk to your, yourself. First of all, you've got to get your life sorted. Because unless you do, you can't take somebody else there. You have no authority or mandated right to take somebody else someplace you've never been. That's one of the things I hate about preachers who preach stuff from the pulpit. They've never been there themselves. All that is is a nice load of information. They put that person under a burden because this door is not open in the past. It'll release the door around their own life. And so, you know, it's, it's important that you get your life sorted. If you don't, you will wind yourself up down the line in trouble because you will reap what you sow. If you sow, and, sorry, if you sow out of another's experience that is not your own, you will reap death. But if your experience is your own and you sow out of that experience, you will reap life. Don't ever try and take somebody else's experience and live out of the revelation of that experience. Get your own experience. Get your own revelation and work with it so that you can live in it. All I'm doing is giving you a doorway and saying, hey, if God can do it for me, he can do it for any one of you. It's because I chose to actually humble myself and walk my way with the presence of God. And so I, I, I kind of walked my way through these things. So I want to come back to the mind. We've got 10 minutes before we need to finish. Each of these gateways has significance. And each of them is very important. And particularly for who we are as the children of God. Um, I don't know this afternoon whether I'm going to get time to teach everything I want to do teach. But I'm going to throw this out there for you because it's important. Now, you'll go home with many, many things to do. Don't worry about the many, many things to do. Pick one and do it. All right, I work on one, get a foundation on one, then go to the next one. I, I had one, one lady came to me and said, you know, I've got 54 things I have to do. Which one do I choose? So I said, whatever your heart desires, choose that one first. And then work on it. And so I, I, in the process of working through this thing here, um, in the mind, I became very fascinated with the mind. And of course, I'd go and do these other things. And I'd talk a little bit about how the human mind works. But there's another whole issue, and that's related to memory. Memory is a, 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 a very significant thing that we need to deal with. And... In fact, I won't go down there, but I'll talk about another thing to you because I may get to do that session later. If I don't do some of these sessions, by the way, let me stop rambling. If I don't do some of these sessions, we have a lot of tapes out there which teach on this. What, what I specifically want to talk about is actually redeeming your life by the blood. I, I, um, I'm just changing tack here a little bit. My body, soul, and spirit are fully entangled in the realm of the kingdom. The Bible says this, um, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from the enmity of the sin recorded against us. And I became very interested in that redemption process. I do a teaching on the covenant of adoption and the redeeming process in that covenant and the importance of it and how we can become one with the covenant and how it can become ours. But part of that covenant that is described and, and the protocol of a, of a covenant is that a Roman judge or a judge would take the, the, the person's name here with the, with the information about their life, their birth date, their whatever, da, 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 all the information about any criminal cases, any disputes, any marriage, any children, any whatever would be written in that bit of paper. And then he'd take another bit of paper. Oh, I don't have a blank one here. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. He would take another bit of paper. He will take another bit of paper that would look like that. And what would happen is that in the, in the court of law is that the person adopting the person to become a family member would come into the court with seven testators. Those seven testators would sign the base of this new document as a testimony of their desire to be engaged with the life of this new person here to train them so that their name they bear could become part of the family name. Now what would happen is then the person adopting would come in and they would say, this is the person's new name. And the new name would be written on the top of the page. Then the person who was being adopted would come into the court. The judge would say, is this your name? And he would say, yes. Is this who you are? Is this what you've done? Is this da, da, da? Yes, 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 yes. Then on this paper, the, 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 the judge will say, this is now your new name. This is now your new name. You carry a different name than this. What he would then do is he would take a damp rag, because they never had acid in the ink in those days. They would take a damp rag, and they would wipe 
that slate clean. What they would be left with then is that record. So from the point of his adoption, there was no more record but that. And so from that point, you began to write your own record of your new life. This could never, ever be recalled. Never. Ever, ever. In any dispute, dis dispute criminal case, anything, this ceased to exist. And so what we have here now is an issue because all of us are still living out of this. Yet God's given us provision to live out of this. And so to make that, I've got to do something with this. And so it's amazing, you know, when, they, when you're with the spirit and wisdom and understanding, they, they teach you stuff, which is really great. That's what their job is. And so when I was with the spirit of understanding, I said to me, I want to know how to do this. And then through the protocol and process of dealing with the images in my mind and the process of that, which I'll get to this afternoon, I realized that there was a power in the blood to redeem me, to actually change, fully change this to this. Had the capacity was given to me freely, the issue was I had never appropriated it. So I made a decision after working my way through these gateways after five years. I made a decision that I felt so different with that. I decided to take the blood of Jesus and actually begin to clean my life. Just like the Roman judge, wiping the page of my life free from the dominion of the record of the thing that was written against me, being redeemed under the power of what he gave me. And so I decided to take a year of my life. I take the first year of my life, the second year, all the way up to 32 years of age. You know, it's old I was then. I'm now 195, no, not really. And so, well, anyway, whatever. And so what I began to do was I began to work my way through each year of my life. So for 32 days, I prayed. That's all I did. I didn't pray for Auntie Floozy or Auntie Jane down the road or Mr. So-and-so overseas. I prayed for my own life because if I can't go there, then it's no good me praying for them because I won't be able to take them there anyway. So it's a useless time me praying for them. Okay? And so I walked my way through for 32 days. I walked my way through my, my first year. Father, I thank you for the first year of my life. Today I bring that year in and I choose to redeem it. Father, everything that occurred in that year, I wipe it with the blood. I redeem myself on the enmity, the record, the power, the influence. Da, da, da. For an hour every day I pray into the first year of my life. Then the second year, then the third year, then the fourth year. By the time I got to the 32 years, I felt different. I was going, boy, I feel so different. And some of the voices had stopped in my head. I'm going, whoa. So I decided, well, if that's the case, it's going to affect me like that. I'll go and even take it harder to it now. I've got to, you've got to understand with me, when I find something works, I start taking it to its finest point I can to refine it right down so I can get the biggest impact on the enemy I can. Now, that's where I went because I love doing that, you see. So I thought, I'll go and fix this thing really now because I feel so much different there. I'm going to go and take the first year of my life. I took the 12 months of the first year of my life. And so I prayed over for the next, next 10 days. I prayed over the first year of my life, each month of the year. And then I worked my way all the way through to 33 years of age because by then I was 33 years of age. So I worked my way through all the months. By the time I got through that, it was like, Ow, I feel good, da, 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 da. I thought, well, actually, that's made me feel so different. I'm going to go and take the first year, the first week of the day of my life. And so it took me a year to pray through every week of my life, <coughs> redeeming it by the blood. That had so much effect on me, I thought I'd take and go and take every day of the year of my life, right from the point of conception. So I went and took every day of the year of my life, and I had a calendar with a tick off each day that I've done. Right through my year, I worked my way right through. By the time I got to about 27 years of age, it was just like, well, this is a rest of a waste of time because nothing else is happening. Because the process had already been finished and completed because I had made an appropriation of the importance of a document in the realm of the kingdom that set me apart as a son. And so it so changed my life that I thought I would share it with someone else. And this lady had... When she was about the age of four, she had been molested by her four brothers, right up to about the age of 12. Then she had got married to a demon spirit. The demon spirit would rape her. She then got into prostitution at the age of 15. Then she was married to this demon. She'd get involved in prostitution, and then she'd come home, and then the demon would rape her. And then, and see, so that was her life. 
And so when, when she came, when, when she was there in this, in this conference we were in, um, I thought, well, I'll fix that thing because I could see it. And I know how they were married. I know the soul tie, so I thought I'd fix that too. So I had the opportunity to speak to her. And she watched me through the whole meeting because she was really afraid of, of people because of this demon and what it would do to her when she spoke. And so um, I looked at her and I said, it's going to be okay. And that was all she needed was that word. And so she came in and said, I know it's going to be okay because I've been watching you and the way you love people is what I need because there's this thing in me. I said, I know all about it. And I, so I, I explained to her what had happened to her life. I said, this is what's been happening. Da, 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 da. And she's going, yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, you can get free and this is what you've got to do. And so we got it delivered and all that stuff. It was all good. Then I said, now here's the issue. You're going to need to walk through your life with the blood. This is what I want you to do. She rang me two years later totally and absolutely free like this is the power of the blood of jesus christ this is the power of the redeeming influence that jesus gave us in his blood to redeem us from the record and the enmity of sin written against our lives all you got to do is give him a chance all you got to do is take the first step and he will run towards you because he wants you to be a pure white bride ready for him to receive into his kingdom. And I mean, I'll tell you, if it's worked for me and it's worked for her, it'll work for anyone. All you got to do, but it takes work. It doesn't go with somebody going, Shandy Bundy, you're blessed on Sunday. You're gonna, everything's going to be right on Monday. It doesn't happen like that. You have got to do the work. And it does take work. What I found too in that process was that there would be days when I couldn't break through the day. Like I would be praying over it and it would be like, Bleh. just like, what is wrong with that day? And so I'd, I'd mark it on my calendar and then I'd finish the month and I'd come back to that day. And so I got so mad because it was, Bleh, that I'd take every hour of the day. And I'd pray specifically through the day. And you know what I began to find? Was that that was the days when I'd been touched by sin. That it had a record in my soul and spirit, in my, in my soul and my body, of a testimony of a doorway that that thing had access to. And I'd start to pray and I'd feel these things in the spirit world coming at me. And then you can hammer them away because you're under the blood. And you can deal with them and rip their head off. And ah, it was really good. And so I, I thoroughly enjoyed my spirit walk in those, in those years. And, and it's only grown since then. And it's amazing because I don't, you know, I don't have the voices in my brain. I don't have the garbage, the influence of images. You know, the, it's amazing to walk free of that stuff. You know, and to try, the issue then is to keep short accounts. Keep short accounts. That's what the blood's for, to keep short accounts. Yeah, well, I, I gave an example on the CD there just about how to pray through my first year. Just like I, I started praying before. Father, I thank you for this first year of my life. Today I declare to that year that it's been redeemed by the blood. I take that blood of Jesus and I redeem that year. I just would pray through it. And so what I learned to do was to pray in tongues in English. And so I'd be praying in English so I could pray with understanding, but out of my spirit in English. Because it's just another gift. I mean, it's, one, it's called the gift of diversity of tongues. And it's no problem to pray in English in tongues. As long as you give your spirit man room to move like that. It's not, it's not an issue. It's more here. The problem's here because you think you're praying. And, uh, and so it's just, it's just a process. It's easy. That's how I learned how to pray. I was actually not going to listen to somebody else, but actually praying in English in tongues because I wanted to understand what I was praying. And sometimes I get the interpretation of tongues in another language and I speak and then learn how to, other ways how to pray. So, I mean, it's not hard. It's just you can teach people to do this stuff. It's actually a learned process. And so, anyway, so I... So, so it's, it's like in a conference, often you've got to understand that, that th these are my notes. So I've now spent an hour and 10 minutes talking with you from notes. It's because I've learned how to pray in tongues in the Spirit, so I speak out of my spirit from the flow of the anointing that I can feel from something that gets quickened on something else. And so I'm just trying to follow my spirit when I'm speaking. So it's actually not a hard job to preach. It's easy. Because once you engage the realm of the kingdom, the kingdom will flow. Because all the kingdom wants is a chance to bubble up and becomes a river. Then you get in the river and you can just live out of the river all day. And it's not hard. But we have to think, you know, like Greek, we've got to have all these things in line. No, you've got to flow with your spirit. It's about a spirit engagement, not about a written engagement. Amen? Let's pray. 
Father, I want to thank you today for the blood of your Son. Father, thank you for the way that we have been made with a spirit, a soul, and a body. Father, just like we have a triune God, we are a triune being. Father, that our spirit man is able to engage and function in who he is in the kingdom realm. That our soul will be transformed, Father, by the revelation of our spirit. And our body would be transfigured by the revelation of our soul. Father, I thank you that there would come a day when our body would be transfigured. Lord, that the light of the glory that is within us would flow through us, touching the world that is around us. Lord, that we would bear the image of the DNA that we carry in the center of our being, that the reflection of that glory that sits in us, that candle, the manifold wisdom and glory and majesty of the might of the dominion of who we are inside would be revealed through our soul, through our body, into the world around us. Father, I ask that as these people begin to walk through this journey, because, Lord, it is a journey. Father, as they walk through the journey, I ask, Lord, that the redeeming hand of your glory would come upon them. Father, that the blood of Jesus, would, that they would come into a revelation of the blood of Jesus for their lives. Lord, that as they step into this arena of the kingdom realm, Father, they would be unlocked like a door for them, that they would be able to go through that door. Jesus, today, you are the door. You are the door to the tree of life. Jesus, thank you that as we overcome, your word says in Revelation, to them that overcome will I grant to eat of the tree of life. Lord, we choose the way of that tree, to live in it, to walk in it, that who we are in the spirit would live forever. Father, I thank you for these people today. I bless them, Lord, with revelation of the kingdom realm that as they walk in these things, that it would become part of their life, that we would become in turn the expression of who you are in the world around us. Father, we receive from you today all that we need for our present environment. Father, we receive it that we might walk through that and become your sons on the face of the earth. In Jesus' name, yes, you are. Hallelujah.